This year, Angie and I will celebrate our 20th wedding anniversary. December 15th, 2001 was a beautiful Saturday afternoon. The auditorium and the reception area were perfectly decorated for a Christmas wedding. It was a beautiful afternoon, and there are a lot of things about that day that I frankly just don't remember 20 years later. But one thing I do remember is that as Angie and I were preparing to leave for our honeymoon, we were literally making our way to the car. A good friend of mine, Larry Owens, came up to me, patted me on the back, and he said, Johnny, he said, if you can just make it through that first year of marriage, everything will be okay after that. <laughs> I looked at him, and I said, what? I said, you, you chose now to tell me that? He was so right. That was some great counsel from a really good friend. Because the first year of marriage, in many marriages, can be difficult. It's just hard work. And there are a lot of experts that say that it takes seven or eight years to really get to the good stuff of marriage. I'm reminded of these two truths about a successful marriage. Now, I found this out personally, but I also found it out by talking to couples that have been married for 50, 60 years even 70 years. Everybody agrees that marriage is hard work. It's just going to be difficult work. One of the things of ones that have been married, especially the longevity of marriage, is I think about the, the resolve that they had in their eyes as they're talking of simply saying that Johnny quitting was never an option. They didn't give up on each other because that was not their view of marriage. Their marriage involved a commitment to God and a commitment to each other. Marriage is hard work. That's truth number one. Truth number two is that it's really, really worth it. That when we make it through those difficult days, we're able to look ahead and we're able to see how God can bless a marriage. I am so excited this month to open our Bibles to the book of Ephesians. We're going to be talking about pictures of the church. Today, the picture of the church comes from Ephesians chapter 5, where we see the church as the bride of Christ. Now, remember these two truths about a successful marriage? Well, they also hold true for a successful church. I need to tell you, brothers and sisters in Christ, that a successful church is going to be really, really hard. It's going to take some really, really hard work. Every day is not perfect. Every day is not easy. There will be difficult seasons and difficult times in church life. But when we stick together and when we remain focused on God and His Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we will find out that it's going to be really, really worth it. So keep those ideas in mind. To be successful in marriage and in the church, it's going to be, at times, really hard, but it's going to be really worth it. The way that church is seen, both in our lives individually and in our community, it really has changed over the years, and, and it hasn't been that long ago that then church was the center. It was the center of community. It was the center of life. It was our center of service and of fellowship. We made our best friends at church. It's interesting to see how the idea of church from even just those few years ago has changed to when we look at church now. Because now, well, life has gotten busy. We've gotten involved in a lot of other things. That's not an individual issue. That is a, a collective statement. In many cases, we've gotten involved in a number of different activities, whether it's things that our children are doing, whether it's things that we is doing as a husband or a wife, or maybe you're doing that individually, but there are so many things that get us busy. And so we just get to a point that, man, we're just, we're so busy or we're so tired, and, and I can't tell you the number of times that I hear, man, Johnny, I, I'm sorry I missed Bible study last night, but, man, it, it's, things are just so busy, and I, I just needed some time to catch up. Or Johnny, you just don't understand, I'm just so tired and I just needed yesterday just to, to rest. I had to catch up. Do, do we understand the significance of the priority established in that statement? What happens is that if life gets busy or if we get tired, church 
is the first thing to go. That's where we are now. Now you take that and you throw a good old pandemic in there and here's what we have found is that there are a lot of people uh, over the last few weeks and even months that have re-engaged in some normalcy of life. Started going out to eat, going on vacations, doing this, doing that. But it's been interesting to see in so many cases that coming back and filling our spot in the pew has been the last thing on our to-do list. I think that is extremely interesting. It's, it's sad and it's discouraging because church should be the center of our lives. It should be at the top of our list, not at the bottom of our list of priorities. Now, experts are going ahead and they're trying to give us a heads up. They're saying, look, as everything comes back to somewhat of a new normal, Experts are telling us to expect attendance in our congregations to be down 20%. Across the board, expect attendance to be down 20%. Not only that, but expect in a lot of cases those that were once regular attendees will now become occasional attendees. And those that we saw Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, every week that, well, it may be every other week. It may even be once a month. I, I hope that those numbers are not true, but we are already seeing evidence that that very idea is coming to fruition. Again, I hope that in the long run, I hope that that's wrong, but we are seeing already indications of that. That's why I think this is the perfect time for us to stop and to simply ask, why church? Why is church important? Why should church have this level of priority in our lives? What we're going to do this month is to go to the book of Ephesians, look at five different pictures that Paul paints in this beautiful letter, pictures of the church. And it's going to help us answer this question of why church is so important in our lives. This morning we turn to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 33, and we're going to look at the church as the bride of Christ. We begin reading in verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of His body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also Love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. There are so many good points in this passage that point to a successful marriage. Successful husband, wife, marriage. But we're also talking about Christ in the church, and, and it even gets to the point that even Paul is like, wow, this... this so, so what, what are we talking about? Are we talking about this human marriage? Are we talking about Christ and the church? And Paul's answer is, well, yes. But ultimately, he says, I need us to understand this. The big point to take away from this, the big point to make sure that we understand is he's talking about Christ as the bridegroom and the church as the bride of Christ. Now, so what does that mean for us? I'm going to suggest to you that as Paul paints this picture, that if, if we wanted to see what a successful 
marriage should look like between a husband and wife. We should be able to look at the church. The church should set that example for us that we see Christ as the bridegroom and the church as the bride of Christ. And it's there that we should be able to see what a true marriage, what a good marriage looks like. But, but here's my question. Does that work today? And here's why I ask that question. Because I look at, I look at the church and there are so many people. Now this is a society problem but it is impacting the church. So much negativity. People are just so negative. They talk about why this won't work, why we shouldn't be doing that, and it's this mixture of being negative and complaining, and I look at that and I think of, well, no wonder so many churches are not successful. Because we're like that husband and wife. Remember the the husband and wife on the Andy Griffith show that just nagged at each other? At times that that's how we sound in the church. That's not what a successful marriage looks like. And it's not what a successful church looks like. So we want to be able to go through and we want to be able to look to see in Scripture of what this healthy marriage of Jesus as the bridegroom and the church as the bride of Christ of what that looks like. I was in the third grade and... uh, and I really had a crush on this girl named Donna. And it was back then, you know, that she would pass the, the, the note that said, do you like me, check yes, no, or maybe. Um, I don't remember doing that. But I do know this. The day that Donna was wearing boots, wearing cowboy boots, and she came and she kicked me in the shin. And when I tell you it hurt, it hurt. And I knew at that point that I was in love. As a third grader, I knew that she had chosen me. I think I misread that. As I think about the fact that that I just really completely misread that, I need us to understand this. Jesus chose us. And don't let there be any mistake about that. Jesus chose us. In fact, if you'll look back at Ephesians chapter 1, there is so much language that lets us know that Jesus chose us. Now, here's something that's interesting. A lot of times we've read this passage, and boy, we have spilled a lot of ink and controversy over what Paul is talking about when he's writing these things. One of the things I think that helps us understand it easier is to simply look at the pronoun. The language is plural, not singular. It's not that Paul is writing that to me or to you. He's writing that to a group of Christians. He's writing that to the church. And I think if we look at it and see that part clearly, the rest of it really comes together. Look at some of these indications. This is the first 14 verses of chapter 1. So many different times where Paul will say that Jesus chose us. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. God has blessed us. Verse 4, He chose us to be holy and blameless. Verse 5, He predestined us for adoption. Verse 6, He has freely given us His glorious grace. So we just see they are just... Three, four, five, six. Each of those verses talks about a way in in, in some form or fashion that is pointing to the fact that Jesus chose us. We need to understand that. God made the first move. Our Lord Jesus made the first move. He chose us. The church was the Lord's idea, not ours. And so this is a beautiful relationship that we have. And we should be so thankful that Jesus chose us. But it's not about just the fact that He chose us. I want us to to look and and to realize that. See, here's something I think about. Man, Jesus loves us. He chose us. We've been given all these blessings. Y'all, we're a room full of imperfect people. Now, knowing that Jesus chose us should help us be more patient, more understanding, and more forgiving of other people. 
just recognizing how blessed we have been should help us as we look at one another to realize that, man, look how patient the Lord has been with us. Remember, church is hard work, but it's really worth it. But we've got to be patient, understanding, and forgiving of one another. As we go back to chapter 5, let's, let's hunker down there today. I want us to see some different things that Jesus teaches us. I want us to look at that, then we're going to go back and we've got to ask a couple of questions. In verse 25, Jesus loves the church. Later in verse 25, it talks about that He sacrificed for the church. In verse 26 says that Jesus came to make the church holy. Jesus makes the church better. That's that part of becoming holy. Jesus makes the church better. Jesus washes us through the Word. And then in verse 29, Jesus feeds and cares for the church. So I need us to remember those five things. Those five things that Jesus teaches us. Now you think, Johnny, you went through that really fast. Don't worry because we're about to go through it again. Because this time we want to talk about it from the perspective of the bride of Christ, the church. And what we want to ask this is what have we learned from Jesus? Well, Jesus loves the church. And so the question we want to ask is, do we? Do we love the church? Do we sacrifice for the church? Do we make the church better? Do we keep a priority in the Word of God? And then finally, do we feed and care for the church? Now let's start digging, shall we? Jesus loved the church. So the question is for us is, do we love the church? Well, Johnny, why is that important? Because Jesus told His disciples... In John 13, verse 34 and 35, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. All right, so Jesus loved the church. We are to love the church, and so that's the question that we want to ask first of all. But there is a trend today. And the trend that we see in the church is this. It's in society. Man, I love Jesus, but I don't like the church. I love Jesus, but I don't like the church. Uh, let me give you a real-life example of what that statement, how it plays out in reality. Uh, let's just say that you and I have become friends. And so I've invited you to our home to share a meal with our family. And so you come to our house, and, and, and we sit down, and we're eating, and you immediately start talking bad about Angie, about my wife. You talk bad about her role as a wife or as a preacher's wife, or her role as a mother, or her role as a school teacher. You don't have anything good to say about her. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Your stay at my home will be brief. Because if, if you act, talk, or treat my wife in that way, it is, man, I love my wife. I love my wife. And, and, and I will not accept that from you. In other words, we can't be friends. And so how do you think our Lord Jesus feels when people will say, oh, I love Jesus, but the church this and the church that, and we're negative about this and we complain about that. How do you think our Lord feels? You see, we need to be a people that love the church. And people look for a reason to stay away from the church. And Jesus is looking at that and going, I don't get that. I don't understand that. Because Jesus loved the church. Jesus didn't just love the church. Jesus sacrificed for the church. And so we need to ask the question, are we willing 
to sacrifice for the church. Now again, remember, I told you there is this trend that, well, if I get busy or if I get tired, that church is the first thing to go off the, off the list. Man, I just needed some time at home to catch up. I just needed some time at home to rest. Hey, can I ask you this? And this is an honest question. I think this is an important question. I mean, we talk about uh, the, the things that we, we give up church time, we give up worship time and Bible study time, we give up time in service and involvement in ministry to do all of these other things. Just, friend, can I ask us this? When is the last time that you said no to something so that you could say yes to church? When is the last time that you said, I'm sorry, I can't do that because I worship on Sunday? We have Bible study on Wednesday night. I'm involved in this ministry at church and, and they need me and I, I'm involved in that. When was the last time that we sacrificed something for the church? You see, the church is the bride of Christ and Jesus sacrificed for us. And so the question we need to ask, is do we sacrifice for the church? We also need to ask the question, is do we make the church better? Jesus, one of the things that Ephesians 5 says, is that Jesus came to make the church holy, to make us better, to present us as pure and blameless. And I think that's a great question for us to ask, is, is what are we doing, or are we doing anything to make the church better? All right, so here's the trend today. The trend today is, is, is this whole idea of consumerism. You know, consumerism is, is you go and you shop something, and you shop to find the shirt that you like or the car that you like, and, and you can go there, and the salesman has a responsibility to try to sell you on that. And so a lot of people have that same mentality when it comes to church. I'm going to go around, and I'm going to find a church that best needs, meets my needs or my family's needs. In itself, on the surface, it, that comment sounds okay. But if we're not careful, what that has led to actually in our churches today is a lot of people that come in and say, what are you going to do for me? And they sit back and wait, and, and well, would you be interested in teaching a class? Oh no, I'm not, I need you to feed me, I need you to feed my children. But, so who's going to teach? I love this, and it takes the quote from one of our great presidents, but it puts it in context of the church. Now, you remember President Kennedy's quote, and I've just changed this to reflect us for today. Ask not what the church can do for you. Ask what you can do for the church. I've told some of you in, in the last couple of weeks and months is we've actually had some people that have come uh, to, to worship with us and have had others that have been members here for quite some time, but have either called, texted, or come by to visit with me, and simply made this statement, Johnny, I want to be more involved in the work of the church. What can I do to help make the church better? And I will tell you that it is that attitude that will lead to a successful marriage, a successful church, as the bride of Christ, so that we can be presented as pure and blameless before God. What are we doing to make the church better? All right, now, so we've got this idea that also in, in politics, man, you know, politics is so divisive right now, and that if we disagree on one thing, then, well, we, we can't be friends. We have to be very careful that that attitude is not coming into the church. I'm very concerned about the state of our political climate because it is leading to an environment and a cultural uh, climate that is unhealthy, and it is making its way into the church. Instead, the church needs to be this light on a hill. We need to be changing the narrative in our society. Man, that we want to make things better. You see, right now, people are growing more bitter, angry, and divisive. We're seeing that in politics, in society. Unfortunately, we're even seeing it in the church. But friends, that's not how we need to be. 
We need to be looking to make the church better. Don't be that person that just sits here and fault finds and looks and critiques this and criticizes that. Simply ask the question, what can I do to help make the church better? Charles Spurgeon makes this comment. This is a great quote. Nothing is a stumbling block to the man who has the Word of God dwelling in him richly. We want to have the Word of God dwelling in us richly. And so finally we come to this final question. It said, do we feed and do we care for the church? Because again, there is, is this trend of of where we are working so hard. And though, man, the last year has been difficult. It's been difficult to keep the church together. It's been difficult to try to get the church back together. And, and I know that different people are working in, in different timetables of, of coming back. And I, I understand that. Please, I understand that. My point is this. If we're not careful, then we will have this mentality that just getting everybody back here is the end goal. And that's not accurate. We have a lot of areas um, where there are needs. We have a lot of things that have been overlooked in the last year. One of the articles I read this past week talked about how... um, how children and teens have been overlooked during the pandemic, particularly in the area of church. And I have to tell you, that article's dead on accurate. Children were not able to participate in Bible class. And they need that Bible training in a, in a, in a just incredibly desperate way. It is imperative that we get our children back in worship. We get them back in Bible study. And we teach them those truths of Scripture. We have some lost ground to make up. And I hope that we can, can rekindle their fire and their interest in learning the things of God. And that in ministry that we can provide opportunities for them to get to know each other better. And for them to also have opportunity to serve others. That it's a well-rounded ministry. But it's going to take some proactive work in that for us to get back together to make sure that we're working to make the church better. We need to feed and care for the church. Now there are a lot of opportunities in ministry that are already available. And as you see those and you see where you can be involved in that, be proactive. Get involved. There may be some need that you see that we are not addressing as a church family. I hope that you will go through and you are specifically looking at that. And you're looking to see what you can do to help make the church better. And let's feed and let's care for the church. Let's get involved in that. Be proactive. Don't let anyone be overlooked. <clears throat> As a minister, there are a lot of uh, different wedding ceremonies. And I, I, at times we'll go through and I will write something for each couple that's married. But there are certain phrases that tend to make their way into every wedding ceremony. I do that. Other preachers do that. This is one that an old preacher had. It's something that he says to the groom, then something else he says to the bride. I just wanted to share this with you. It's so beautiful as we think about the idea of Christ and the church. Uh, This older preacher says to the groom, says, your bride has paid you the highest compliment within her power to pay. She has left her father, her mother, her home, and given up her very name for you, the man she loves. Then he turns to the bride and he says, Now you be true to your marriage vows and to this man. He has paid you the highest compliment within his power to pay to make you the queen of his home and his heart. What a beautiful thought for Mary. But as we think about our Lord and Savior, and we think about the church, I think about the fact that Jesus first chose us. He first chose us. And there are so many things that He wants to teach us. 
He teaches us to love one another. He teaches us to sacrifice one another, to help make the church better, to have a solid priority in the Word of God. And then he, he also teaches us to feed and care for one another. And we have an opportunity now to respond to that invitation. Jesus chose us, but, but what about us? Have, have you made that commitment to be faithful to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to name Him as Lord and to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And one of the things that we often see is we, we see couples that will renew their marriage vows after a certain number of years. Uh, a lot of times it's just a beautiful ceremony and a way to celebrate uh, a certain milestone in their marriage. But there are times that some of us, maybe in the church, need to renew our vows to the Lord. Because maybe we need to rehear those. Maybe we need to be reminded of what the Lord has done for us and what our commitment needs to be to Him. Not only to Him, but also to His bride. To the bride of Christ and to the church. Remember this. Church, a successful church, it will be hard work. But friends, we know this. It will be hard, but it will be really, really worth it.